It's a great pleasure to welcome our next guest. Welcome, Hanif Qureshi. Uh, hi, I have a question for you. Um, uh, with, with beautiful laundrette, um, you were maybe one of the first people um, to depict uh, a kind of glamorous and exciting uh, way in which the coexistence of different races could work in London uh, and could multiply and give new dimensions to sexual relations. And in other words, you, you could be seen as one of the first advocates of that uh, notion. Um, that was more than 20 years ago. Um, uh, what do you think has happened in the meantime? And do you recognize the description and what, what would you say has happened in the meantime? I think I was aware when I was, when I first began to write, um, I already knew that I was a Paki. Um, I'd grown up in South London uh, in the 50s and through the 60s. And we were uh, 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 quite an isolated, I guess, Asian family. My mother was English, my father was from India, stroke Pakistan. And I grew up in an entirely white world. And I grew up in a world that was also incredibly racist. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we thought we were going to be deported. We were going to be sent home on the next boat. After all, you know, there have been many precedents in Europe in the 20th century for, uh, for racism. So when I began to write, I think I began to write in order to save my life. I wrote because I thought I was going mad. Because if you are the victim of racism and you're living in a white society, um, you don't see yourself anywhere. There, there is nobody else like you in the world, in the media. And so I began to write in order to, I think, hold myself together, to keep all the bits in the same, in the same place. So for me to write was to make myself. And I also wanted to, like most people, I wanted to tell my story. I wanted to say, look, you know, we're here. There are Pakistani people living in South London, and this is our lives. So when I started to work in the theater and later with my beautiful laundrette, I think I became aware that I was telling stories which hadn't been told really in Europe before, which were, about, which, which were about immigration from the former colonies, from Pakistan, India, uh, Sri Lanka, and so on. So I wanted to say something that hadn't been said before, and I wanted to put Asian people on the screen. And I think I had to prove, with my beautiful laundrette particularly, which I made with Stephen Frears, I had to show that it was possible to make films about these people, about yeah, this subject. Yeah, yeah a film with an Asian person in it, not only that, a gay Asian person in it, kissing a skinhead. I mean, what more would you want from a film? But it was very hard to convince people that, uh, that they needed this. But the door sort of opened. I think my beautiful laundrette sort of opened the door, and it then became possible to make films about these communities. Yeah. In relation to, actually, um, uh, the script of, this, uh, of the film of my beautiful laundrette, we were actually yesterday trying to find the script, and then reading your introduction, and there was one very interesting thing which was very unexpected, which I wanted you to ask about, because one of the things about this London Marathon, which we think is interesting, is to address also the notion of memory of the city. And one of the first person we spoke preparing the marathon was Eric Hobsbawm. And he said that he really thinks that, you know, hopefully this marathon could also be a form of a protest against forgetting. And uh, I mean, a sort of a notion of memory. And in your sort of introduction to the script, there is a very, very long paragraph where you talk about the seminal importance of the Riverside Studios as a kind of a space for tolerance. You call it a space for tolerance, for skepticism, and for intelligence. I mean, it really sounds like a very interesting model for a cultural institution. You talk about your dialogues with David Cotton, that that actually led to you meeting the director uh, of the film. And I was somehow interesting because we've, we're speaking a lot here about different moments also of the past of London which maybe resonate or can be toolboxes for today and mainly thinking about what the future of cultural institutions can be. I think it would be very, very interesting to hear from you why you think that that moment of the Riverside Studios was so kind of particularly interesting. You, you even said that it functioned like a university to some extent. Well, I came from the suburbs um, and the biggest event for me coming from the suburbs was when you crossed the river. We crossed the river. You know, we used to go up to the, in the 60s, we used to go up the King's Road. And on Saturday, everybody would walk up and down the King's Road. And kids, 
from Bromley, from the suburbs where I was from, we would get the train and we'd cross the river. When you crossed the river, you knew you were free and you knew that you were in the city. And I still think of, of London, of the, of, of the city, as being full of excitement for me, for a kid from the suburbs. And it's partly to do with race. I mean, one of the ways in which any culture is going to develop, the only way a culture expands, and the only way a culture remains alive is by letting new people into it. You know? And you've got to let people into the culture who haven't spoken before. And when you hear them speaking, you know that there's new life in, 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 in the in the system. So for me, London is a place where people can speak more freely and they speak to each other and there are more people and they're from more places. So um, the possibility of being with people who were talented, who, who were artistic, but also who worked in a number of fields. We were talking about Riverside. When I went to Riverside, I met poets, I met dancers, I met playwrights, I met actors, um, etc., etc. Uh, and I'm very much against segregation in the media. I love the idea that architects, painters, writers, musicians might meet and talk together. I've never, I, I've never, met, I've never met an architect before. Actually, it's fantastic. <laughs> anyway. I was looking for someone to do my house actually as well. <laughs> um, uh, late, later, we will have a geographer, Doreen Messi. Uh, and and uh, although she is also, of course, um, very impressed by London's uh, ability to absorb many different cultures and, and to actually coexist and live with many different um, f strangers, uh, she's also more uh, uh, critical and also kind of pointing out that the kind of dark side of that to the extent that in order to sustain its, its current level of... Um, um, civilization, let's say, it, it needs to import kind of many people from uh, abroad, uh, and and that, for instance, uh, English hospitals are unthinkable uh, without uh, a constant importation of Sri Lankan or Ghanese uh, uh, people from poor countries that survive here under difficult circumstances, and where particularly the fact that we import people from poor countries that have been educated there. Um, so, could you comment on the dark side? Of well, that's that? how immigration uh, works, uh, and that's how capitalism works. Uh, capitalism works by, import, by using labor from the third world, either in the third world or bringing labor, people like my father mm -hmm. and his family, from the third world to the first world. Um, we're not here because we make plays or we, 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 we make paintings or we do architecture. We're really here to work. I mean, most Pakistanis came, came to Britain to work in the mills. Mm -hmm. um, What's always interesting is the next generation and the generation after that. And my father wanted us to be English. He said to me that if I was going to be successful in England, I should change my name to Kevin. He thought it was a great idea. And I've always been very attached to the name Kevin, which is, you might not know, you might know, is a very English, rather clunky name. Um, and he thought we had to disappear in England in order to survive. One of the things that happened, has happened, is that there's been a celebration. Um, as you say, of ethnicity and different voices. And you say the city's dark. Well, a city's going to be dark. Um, it's the darkness that makes the city interesting. It's the darkness that makes anything interesting. If you're a writer or an artist of any sort, it's the darkness that you're, that you're looking for. It's the interesting bit of our lives. You can't move that bit out. That's just going to go somewhere else and, and turn out worse. Um, it seems to me that... It, the, the I, I think this is a very interesting kind of thing because uh, in previous conversations, you, you weren't there with architects and with artists. We had to introduce the whole notion of darkness because from, from their domains it seemed to have disappeared. Uh, when I go to a city, the bit of the city I want to see is the dirty bit. I want to see the ports. I want to see where the dealers are. I want to see where the whores are, where the bad people are. Because you really get a flavor. You get a sense of what the place is really like. You know, in the whole areas of London where you can see London... Uh, much more authentically than you can in places like Covent Garden, for instance. Now also, the city obviously has to do with complex, the sort of paradox of complex cohesion or something like that. And I was wondering, um, when I spoke to Orhan Pamuk in Istanbul some months ago, uh, he said that he thinks it's actually very often uh, literature inventing cities. I mean, he was sort of mentioning that sort of whole idea of Gerard de Nerval kind of inventing Istanbul to some extent. And I was wondering, um, because one of the things with this marathon we want to sort of uh, hopefully achieve is to sort of question that idea if there is such a thing as a theory of London 
and we are wondering how you in 2006 see London and if you, uh, how, if you think that there is such a thing as a, a, a theory about London. Well, there are stories, I guess. I think stories is probably a better word than theory. Um, and there are the stories that people tell about this city in order to make the city and in order to, to live in it. And I guess as a writer, I'm just excited by describing what goes on here. What I want to do is be surprised by what goes on. I want, want to walk on the street and I want to talk to someone or see something mm. that I haven't seen before. And I think it's a, it's a city for me of infinite possibilities. You're never going to run out of mm. bits of it uh, to see or people to talk to and so on. Um, is that a theory? Is that theoretical enough? I think just being interested and walking around and seeing what's going on and that kind of engagement, that seems to me to, to make a city alive by the way you engage with it, by the way you use it, by the way you look at it. I think theories can, uh, are too narrow, they're too constricting. They're good for some things but not good for other things. You can't dance to a theory. Maybe we can move from theories to dreams. Do you have any kind of dreams related to London or any kind of unrealized ideas or projects you'd like to see realized? I think what I want to do is, to, is, 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 is just to tell stories about the city and cities that, the stories that just occur to me as I wander around in a rather random way. I think being a writer is such a random project. I, I don't know how you guys work, but when I get up in the morning, I don't want to know what I'm going to do that day mm. or how it's going to turn out. I want to have a dream or tell a story or, or find something that seems to, to surprise me or to shock me, I guess. Yeah. Um, and that's when I'm interested. If I know what I'm going to do, uh, it's bad enough getting up as it is. If I know what I'm going to do, it would be even worse, I think. I, I, I want to talk uh, about uh, critics. I, I've kind of witnessed uh, your career, and, and anyone witnessing your career is uh, confronted with uh, somebody who is received sometimes very critically and sometimes with a lot of adulation. I've seen kind of very few writers who are so inconsistently described. Uh, what, what has that done for your, for your life? Has it kept you alert, or...? Um, I'm sure you feel like this. I think uh -huh. in the end, you just go your own way. Uh -huh. You know, you are going to do your work. There are certain subjects, certain areas of your life, certain bits of your psyche that you're particularly interested in. Uh -huh. You know, it's like you're painting the wall blue and you think blue is a great color today, and a critic come, comes along and says, well, I think green would be better. But if you're into the blue, you know, it's going to be the blue. So. Uh, I mean, people can say what they like. I mean, you can't control, uh, uh, fortunately and unfortunately, what goes on in other people's minds or what they say about you. Um, the thing about me is that my work's cheap. You know, I just need a bit of paper and a pen and maybe someone will publish it and so on. I mean, your stuff costs millions of pounds. Oh. I can see that you get a, a, a much more pressure than, than I do. When I do something, nobody really bothers me because they think, well, who gives a damn anyway? Whereas your stuff's really expensive, so you must have lots of people saying, well, those windows are too small, or those windows are too big, or whatever, or why aren't the windows on the top, and so on. Um, but I don't have that. I, w I really work quite freely, I guess, yeah. which is the, the virtue and the freedom uh, of being a writer to invent freely. I think sometimes it might be a good idea if there was more criticism. You might feel there was more, as it were, response to what you do. Um, it seems to me that in England, if you're a writer, there's a sort of general indifference. Anywhere else, if you're a writer, they kill you and torture you. But in England, they take no notice of you. <laughs> Which is probably better. Um, does your background and your history uh, make you somebody with a particular insight in 7-7? Well, I became very interested in what's become known as Muslim fundamentalism in the 80s particularly after going to Pakistan to stay with my family for the first time in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. and my, my uncles were sort of middle class intellectuals, liberals and so on. And they said to me that they were being crushed. They were crushed on, on the one hand between the fundamentalists, on the other hand between the United States. Uh, and they realized it was all over. Uh, and then in 89, my friend Salman Rushdie had a fatwa 
um, put on him by the Iranians. And so in the, eight, in the 90s, I began to hang around with young kids who were called fundamentalists. I went to the colleges and the mosques and began to talk to these kids. I wrote a novel called The Black Album and then a film mm -hmm. called My Son the Fanatic, which was concerned with some of these things. Mm -hmm. But I became very aware that all over the Muslim world, young people become de deeply disillusioned with the Muslim regimes, right? And the most significant post-war event, really, I would say, is the Iranian Revolution, when it occurred to the Muslim masses that they could overthrow people like the Shah and establish um, a Muslim ideology, right? And, and if you're living in a Muslim world, a Muslim ideology is far more liberating, far purer, far better in every way than the corruption of people like the Shah. So radical Islam began as a kind of liberation movement. It's hard to believe that. But this was where the people organized, on the street, in the mosques, right, in order to throw, overthrow people like the Shah. But it became deeply corrupt. And after the fall of, fall of uh, the Berlin Wall, it became implicated with, with, with the West. You know, Bush, Blair need radical Islam in order to keep the West um, um, sure. militarized, let's say. Um, do I have any insight into it? Well, all, lots of people all over the Muslim world feel enormous resentment, firstly about what's happening in their own countries, and secondly about what's happening to the Muslim world because of the, the enormous efforts of, of Bush and Blair to kill them. Um, so there are real resentments here. There are deep resentments. Now, you could psycho psychologize these kids and say these kids are fucked up because of X, Y, and Z, and so on, and I've done that. But it seems to me that what we have to do now with young people who have a resentment is engage with them, you know, and see what their resentments are. That doesn't mean that we turn London into a Muslim city. It's already a great Muslim city. But that we have to engage with these people. And I think one of the, the interesting things about you having these conversations um, is that you value the art of conversation, i.e. that people speak to each other for a long time before they kill each other. It seems to me to be a good idea. In terms of conversation, a lot has been written about your ongoing conversation with Salman Rushdie, who is actually uh, was supposed to join us here, but he is out of the country, so he will come for the October Marathon. So I was somehow wondering if you could tell us a little bit about this dialogue and if uh, you've sort of collaborated with him or what, what this dialogue how well, Rushdie sort of is, a, is an Indian writer. I realized for the first time when I went to, 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 to Pakistan, one of my uncles said to me, he said, he looked at me rather oddly as if I were a curiosity, and he said to me, the thing is, he said, we're Pakistanis, aren't we, he said. He said, but you're just a Paki, he said, and you'll always be a Paki. And that really shocked me because I thought, I was going home to Pakistan, this was my home, my family, the bosom, I would be, you know, I'd be welcomed here, I belong here. I realized I was living in a, in a fascist Muslim state, where, 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 and I hated every minute of it. Um, so I realized I was an English kid, you know, and I didn't have uh, really the same connection with the subcontinent that somebody like Rushdie has. And I think as an artist, although there may be connections between you know, Rushdie or Zadie Smith or Monica Ali or any of the other so-called post-colonialists, we're all artists who, you know, we go our own way and we do our own thing. Um, but I think the publication of Midnight's Children in the 80s was a huge breakthrough in British writing. It suddenly showed Midnight's Children and later on with My Beautiful Laundra, the door opened. It wasn't provincial. Um, insular England. There was a new world coming in through the door, and I think British culture really perked up after that. Okay, I have maybe we have a last her. question or more questions. Actually, one thing I wanted to ask you is, uh, as you've mentioned before about your working process and that you actually not, I mean, it's not so much about the master plan, but a quite spontaneous process of work. And I was wondering what you're working on at the moment. If um, well, as I've got older, one of the things is uh, that I notice is that you're young for a very long time, and then suddenly the clock tick, the clock chimes, and, and, and you're old. And I became very interested in older people. And I made a film called The Mother, which was about a, 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 an older woman who begins a sexual relationship with, in fact, with James Bond. <laughs> Um, and I've recently re uh, made a film with Roger Michel called Venus, which is about two old blokes and a minga. A minga is a, is a girl, a street girl. Um, and I just became interested in these two old blokes, played by Peter O'Toole and Leslie Phillips. And suddenly you just 
throw a girl into the middle. And one of the things I noticed, I watch, I watch a lot of television. I know I should be reading Proust, but I watch a lot of television. And I noticed that, it was, that, 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 that you were no, we no longer are allowed to make jokes about Pakistanis, mm -hmm. certainly not about Jews or other ethnic groups, but you could make jokes about white working class girls, yeah. you know, mingers. And I noticed watching Catherine Tate and uh, Little Britain and so on, that white working class girls were sort of scapegoats, you know, these lazy fat slags who never worked, you know, had lots of babies with black men and so on. Weren't, weren't they, you know, mingers? So I wrote a film about a minger. Um, do, you have, do you have mingers in Holland? Do you know the concept of the minger? Is that...? Uh, I live here, so... so. Uh... Right. Oh, right, okay. Well, then the, the concept of the minger won't have escaped you. So we, we, are, we are stuck with time. Thank you very much. All right. Thank, thank you. you very much indeed. Thank you.